The Christian Sacrifice by Alexander McLaren By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. But to do good and to communicate, forget not. For with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. Hebrews 13, verses 15 and 16. Much attention is given now to the, to the study of comparative religion. The beliefs and observances of the rudest tribes are narrowly scrutinized in order to discover the underlying ideas. And many a practice which seems to be trivial, absurd, or sanguinary is found to have its foundation in some noble and profound thought, charity and insight have both gained by the study. But singularly enough, the very people who are so interested in the rationale of the rights of savages will turn away when anybody applies a similar process to the ritual of the Jews. That is what this epistle to the Hebrews does. It translates altar, ritual festivals, priests into thoughts. And it declares that Jesus Christ is the only adequate and abiding embodiment of these thoughts. We are not dressing Christian truth in a foreign garb when we express the substance of its revelation in language borrowed from the ritualistic system that preceded it. But we are extricating truths which the world needs today as much as it ever did from the form in which they were embodied for one stage of religion when we translate them into their Christian equivalents. So the writer here has been speaking about Christ as, by his death, sanctifying his people. And on that great thought, that he is what all priesthood symbolizes and what all bloody sacrifices reach out towards, he builds this grand exhortation of my text, which is at once a lofty conception of what the Christian life ought to be and a directory as to the method by which it may become so. By him, let us offer sacrifices continually, for with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. Now, it seems to me that there are here mainly three points to be looked at. First, the basis of. Second, the material of. And third, the divine delight in the sacrifices of the Christian life. And to these three points, I ask your attention. One, first, the note here, the emphatic way in which the one basis of Christian sacrifice is laid down. Anybody who can consult the original will see what indeed is partially expressed in our translation, that the position of these two words, through or by him, underscores and puts great emphasis upon them. There are two thoughts which may be included in them. The one, that Jesus is the priest by whose mediation we come to God, and the other that he is the sacrifice on the footing of which we can present our sacrifices. It seems to me, however, that it is the latter idea principally that is in the writer's mind here. And on it, I touch lightly in a few words. Now, let me recall to you as a worldwide fact, which is expressed in the noblest form in the ancient Jewish ritual that there was a broad line of distinction drawn between two kinds of sacrifices, differing in their material and in their purpose. If I wanted to use mere theological technicalities, which I do not, I should talk about the difference between sacrifices of propitiation and sacrifices of thanksgiving. But let us put these well-worn phrases on one side, as far as we can for the moment. 
Here then is a fact that all the world over and in the mosaic ritual there was expressed a double consciousness. One, that there was somehow or other a black dam between the worshiper and his deity, which needed to be swept away. And the other, that when that barrier was removed, there could be an uninterrupted flow of thanksgiving and of service. So on one altar was laid a bleeding victim and on another which spread the flowers of the field, the fruits of the earth, all things gracious, lovely, fair, and sweet, as expressions of the thankfulness of the reconciled worshipers. One set of sacrifices express the consciousness of sin. The other express the joyful recognition of its removal. Now I want you to know whether that worldwide confession of need is nothing more to us than a mere piece of interesting reminiscence of a stage of development beyond which we have advanced. I do not believe that there is such a gulf of difference between the lowest savage and the most cultivated 19th century Englishman but that the fundamental needs of the one in spirit are almost as identical as are the fundamental needs of the one and the other in regard of bodily wants. And sure I am that if the voice of humanity has declared all the world over, as it has declared, that it is conscious of a cloud that has come between it and the awful power above, and that it seeks by sacrifice the removal of the cloud. The probability is that that need is your need and mine, and that the remedy which humanity has divined as necessary has some affinity with the remedy which God has revealed as provided. I am not going to attempt theorizing about the manner in which the life and death of Jesus Christ sweep away the barrier between us and God and deal with the consciousness of transgression which lies coiled and dormant but always ready to wake and sting in human hearts but I do venture to appeal to each man's and woman's own consciousness and to ask is there not something in us which recognizes the necessity that the sin which stands between God and man shall be swept away? Is there not something in us which recognizes the blessedness of the message, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanseth from all sin? O oh, brethren, do not fancy that it is a mere theological doctrine of an atonement that is in question. It is the possibility of loving access to God as made possible through Jesus and through him alone that I want to press upon your hearts. Through him let us offer. Two, secondly, notice the light which our text throws upon the material or contents of the Christian sacrifice. I need not dwell at all, I suppose, upon the explanation of the words, which are plain enough. The writer seems to me to divide the sacrifice of praise, which he prescribes, into two parts, the praise of the lip and the praise of the life. But before I deal with this twofold distribution of the thought, let me fix upon the main general idea that is expressed here. And that is that the highest notion the noblest and purest of what a Christian life is, is that it is one long sacrifice. Have we risen to the height of that conception? I do not say have we attained to the fulfillment of it. The answer to the latter question one knows only too well. But has it ever dawned upon us that the true ideal of the Christian life which we profess to be living is this, 
a sacrifice. Now that thought involves two things. One is the continuous surrender of self. And that means the absolute suppression of our own wills, the bridling of our own inclinations and fancies, the ceasing obstinately to adhere to our own purposes and conceptions of what is good, the recognition that there is a higher will above us, ruling and guiding, to which we are to submit. Sacrifice means nothing if it does not mean surrender. And surrender is nothing if it is not the surrender of the will. It was a great deal easier for Abraham to take the knife in his hand and climb the hill with the fixed intention of thrusting it into his son's heart than it is for us to take the sword of the Spirit in our hands and slay our own wills. And I am here to say that unless we do, we have very little right to call ourselves Christians. But then, surrender is only half the conception of the sacrifice which has to be accomplished in our whole days and selves. Surrender to God is the full meaning of sacrifice. And that implies the distinct reference of all that I am and all that I do to Him as not only commanding, but as being the aim and end of my life. We are to labor on as at his command. You in your counting houses and mills and shops and homes, and we students in our studies and laboratories and lecture rooms are to link everything with him, with his will, and with the thought of him. What vice could live in that light? What meanness would not be struck dead if we were connected with that great reservoir of the electric force? What slothfulness would not be spurred into unhasting and unresting zeal if all our work were referred to God? Unless thus our lives be sacrificed, in the full sense of conscious surrender to Him, we have yet to learn what is the meaning and the purpose of the propitiatory sacrifice on, on which we say our lives are built. I need not, I suppose, remind you at any length of how our text draws broad and deep the distinction between the nature and the scope of the fundamental offering made by Christ and the offerings made by us. The one takes away the separating barrier. The other is the flow of the stream where the barrier had stood. The one is the melting away of the cloud that hid the sun. The other is the flashing of the mirror of my heart when the sun shines upon it. Our sacrifice is thanksgiving then there will be no reluctance because duty is heavy. There will be no grudging because requirements are great. There will be no avoiding of the obligations of the Christian life in rendering as small a percentage by way of dividend as the creditor up in the heavens will accept. If the offering is a thank offering, then it will be given gladly. The grateful heart does not hold the scales like a scrupulous retail dealer, afraid of putting the thousandth part of an ounce more in than can be avoided. Give all thou canst. High heaven rejects the love of nicely calculated less or more. Power is the measure of duty, and they whose offering is the expression of their thankfulness will heap incense upon the brazier and cover the altar with flowers. Ah, brother, what a blessed life it would be for us if indeed all the painfulness and harshness of duty, with all the efforts of constraint and restriction and stimulus, which so often requires, 
were transmuted into that glad expression of infinite obligation for the great sacrifice on which our life and hopes rest. I do not propose to say much about the two classes of sacrifice into which our writer divides the whole. Words come first, work follows. That order may seem strange, but because we are accustomed to think more of work than word. But the Bible has a solemn reverence for man's utterances of speech, and many a protest against God's great gift of speech abused. And the text rightly supposes that if there is in us any deep, real, abiding, life-shaping thankfulness for the gift of Jesus Christ, it is impossible that our tongues should cleave to the roofs of our mouths, and that we should be contented to live in silence. Loving hearts must speak. What would you think of a husband that never felt any impulse to tell his wife that she was dear to him? Or a mother that never found it needful to unpack her heart of its tenderness, even in perhaps inarticulate croonings over the, over the little child that she pressed to her heart? It seems to me that a dumb Christian, a man that is thankful for Christ's sacrifice, and never feels the need to say so, is as great an anomaly as either of these I have described. Brethren, the conventionalities of our modern life, the proper reticence about personal experience, the reverence due to sacred subjects, all these do prescribe caution and tact, and many another thing, in limiting the evangelistic side of our speech. But is there any such limitation needful for the Eucharistic, the thanksgiving side of our speech? Surely not. In some monasteries and nunneries, there used, there used to be a provision made that at every hour of the four and twenty, and at every moment of every hour, there should be one kneeling figure before the altar, repeating the psalter, so that night and day prayer and praise went up. It was a beautiful idea, beautiful as long as it was an idea, and like a great many other beautiful ideas, made vulgar and sometimes ludicrous when it was put into realization. But it is the symbol of what we should be, with hearts ever occupied with him, and the voice of praise rising unintermittently from our hearts, singing a quiet tune all the day and night long, to him that has loved us and given himself for us. And then the other side of this conception of sacrifice that my text puts forth is that of beneficence amongst men in the general form of doing good and in the specific form of giving money. Two aspects of this combination of word and work may be suggested. It has a message for us professing Christians. All that the world says about the uselessness of singing psalms and praying prayers while neglecting the miserable and the weak, is said far more emphatically in the Bible and ought to be laid to heart, not because sneering godless people say it, because, but because God himself says it. It is vain to pray unless you work. It is sin to work for yourselves unless you own the bond of sympathy with all mankind and live to do good and to communicate. That is a message for others than Christians. There is no real foundation for a broad philanthropy except a deep devotion to God. The service of man is never so well secured as when it is the corollary and second form of the service of God. 3. And so lastly, 
and only a word. Note the divine delight in such sacrifice. Ah, that is a wonderful thought. With such sacrifices, God is well pleased. Now, I take it that that such covers both the points on which I have been dwelling, and that the sacrifices which please him are, first, those which are offered on the basis and footing of Christ's sacrifice, and second, those in which word and work accord well and make one music. With such sacrifices, God is well pleased. We are sometimes too much afraid of believing that there is in the divine heart anything corresponding to our delights in gifts that mean love, because we are so penetrated with the imperfection of all that we can do and give. And sometimes because we are influenced by grand philosophic ideas of the divine nature, so that we think it degrading to him to conceive of anything corresponding to our delight as passing across it. But the Bible is wiser and more reverent than that. And it tells us that however stained and imperfect our gifts and however a man might reject them with scorn, God will take them if they are such that is offered through Jesus Christ. I dare say there are many parents in this congregation who have laid away amongst their treasures some utterly useless thing that one of their children once gave them. No good in it at all, no, but it meant love. And depend upon it, if ye being evil know how to take good gifts, though they are useless, from your children, much more will your heavenly Father accept your stained sacrifices if they come through Christ. Dear brethren, my text preaches to us what is the true sacrifice of the true priesthood in the Christian church. There is one priest who stands alone, offering the one sacrifice that has no parallel no, nor second. No other shares in his priesthood of expiation and intercession, but around and deriving their priestly character from him and made capable of rendering acceptable sacrifices through him stand the whole company of Christian people. And besides these, there are no priesthoods and no sacrifices in the Christian vocabulary or in the Christian church. Would that a generation that seems to be reeling backwards to the beggarly elements of an official priesthood with all its corruptions and degradations of the Christian community would learn the lesson of my text. Ye, all of you, and not any selected number from amongst you. Ye, all of you, are a royal priesthood. There are only two sacrifices in the Christian church. The one offered once for all on Calvary by the high priest himself. The other, the sacrifices of ourselves, by ourselves, Thank offerings for Christ and in his name, which are the true Eucharist.